Okay, excellent. So I'm just going to stop share and I'm going to share with you my presentation for today. So we're starting now. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay. Excellent. Okay. Can somebody just keep an eye on the participants? Uh, Praveen, just to make sure we let them in if they drop out. So I'm going to make a start uh, by basically talking a little bit about a very important topic today, and that's the standardized approach to performing lung ultrasounds in neonates. So over the next 45 minutes, what we're going to do is talk about the protocol, talk about how we take and do a lung ultrasound scan in a neonate, why we choose the probes we do, uh, what is the standardized approach to performing lung ultrasound, uh, how we image optimize on the machine, and then after that, really how we report. But the reason that we need to understand and do this is because it's quite important that we are establishing a standardized approach to trying to make interpretation diagnosis for the purposes of obtaining very good quality images. And this is crucial because in your institutes, as you progress, there will be people who perform lung ultrasound in addition to you. And a simple example I'll give you is that if you start doing and using a particular frequency in a preterm baby to make a diagnosis of respiratory distress syndrome to decide on whether you want to give the baby surfactant and somebody then repeats to see whether there's been uh, uh, a clinical impact because this baby's FiO2 has not gone down, but starts using a different frequency or a different probe, you will interpret that in a completely different way. So it's very, very important that you standardize a few things how you do it, which probes you're using, what frequency you're using for which indication, what regions and how you go about doing the scan. But more importantly, I would say, really how you record and report that scan, because actually that's quite crucial. If you start reporting in different ways, it just makes things quite messy. Uh, more importantly, it can actually alter the way somebody might interpret your findings in a scan, as well as your report 12 hours later if he's repeating that scan. So what are we going to talk about and how? So we're going to talk a little bit about the indications for scanning. So we'll then talk about the infant in the environment during lung scanning. Uh, we'll talk about the machine, how we perform a scan, and we'll end by actually talking about reporting. Now, can I ask, in, in our setup, just to make this a little bit interactive, uh, what, what do you think would be the indications for doing a lung ultrasound for you? In this valid disorder, admit to the NICU. Sure. You'll so, go on. Amazing. Anybody else? And if there is any sudden deterioration of the baby. Beautiful. Maybe on ventilator or on CPAP. Amazing. Amazing. That's really good. Anybody else? To Suspect. Suspectant. <clears throat> baby. Okay. So, administration of surfactant lung ultrasound scores. I had a gentleman say something. Yep. Suspected antenatal problem or... Okay. Just to confirm his diagnosis. Yep. So congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And mm -hmm. uh, Nadia will talk about cystic lesions as well. Uh, not that they're easy to diagnose. Okay. So we've kind of looked at indications. The, I've enumerated all the indications I can think of in the chapter on basics of lung ultrasound. If you guys can come up with other indications, I would be very grateful. But what is really, really crucial from our perspective is that when we talk about indications, we might be doing lung ultrasound because we find we've got a clinical query, or we might be doing lung ultrasound because we've got something on radiology that is actually uh, confusing. 
you know, the question is, do we have a pneumothorax or is that a skin fold? Uh, or we might be doing a lung ultrasound because we're trying to differentiate RDS from transient tachypnea of newborn. But all of these clinical conditions fit into some syndromes, which we're going to cover in the course. So you can have respiratory distress in the term baby at birth who are admitted or not admitted to the neonatal unit. And the differential diagnosis for that will be very different to sudden onset of respiratory distress in a 14-day-old baby who's on the ventilator, 32 weeks intubated, ventilated with deteriorating sepsis. Your differentials might be similar, but you wouldn't make a diagnosis of meconium aspiration in in a baby who's that old, who's 32 weeks. Uh, similarly, if you have an extremely preterm baby who's deteriorating after surfactant, uh, in the first 12 hours of life after you repeat the dose of surfactant, there are lots of differentials there. And you might have to actually think of not just a pneumothorax, maybe another dose of surfactant because RDS is uh, progressing, but it may well be that there is problems with PPHN, which then needs you to diagnose using heart-lung interaction and being able to kind of get an echo or perform an echo. So it's really important for us to be able to standardize this approach to kind of decide what is the clinical context in which we're using lung ultrasound in our unit. So when you look at our colleagues in Paris, now there's group, they don't use chest x-rays at all. I think during the learning phase for all of you, I would say chest X-ray is your is kind of your your fallback. It's it's kind of your standard against which you're comparing your lung ultrasounds in order to kind of make a diagnosis. As you become more experienced, will it? As I've previously emphasized, you'll find that there are certain conditions where lung ultrasound is much more sensitive, where the pickup rate as compared to a chest X-ray, especially for small pneumothoraces, is much higher. And really, in that situation. You will then, after a period of three to six months, maybe 12 months, depending on your learning curve, become more confident in being able to diagnose with or without a chest X-ray. And that's where I would say that when we implement lung ultrasound, we should do it as part of a standard guideline that takes into account the unit ethos with which we're using it. Uh, at the moment where I work and where I previously worked in Southampton, we use it adjunctively in addition to chest x-ray, as opposed to saying that we're not going to use chest x-rays at all. I will explain with each individual condition how that might be, but your guidelines should then have governance which basically takes that into account. Now that governance might say that you have a pneumothorax in a deteriorating baby. Now if you have a tension pneumothorax, that's a clinical diagnosis that you're going to make on translimination. Uh, really, it's not a diagnosis where you wait for a chest X-ray, but a lung ultrasound can be extremely helpful provided the baby's stable enough and gives you time to do it. It is more sensitive, more specific. Now, the question is, do you have the confidence to then store those images and needle or do uh, an appropriate chest strain as an intervention based on your lung ultrasound alone? And your guidelines and your standards need to cover, they need to address these aspects. Now, I am on Wednesday going to share with you the guideline that we have made to try and address some of these issues, which provides a standardized protocol, some of which I'm going to talk about today, so that you can use that in your setup. You can modify it. You're most welcome to kind of uh, change it as you please. But I, it's a really good starting point for anybody who's starting to learn and implement lung ultrasound in the unit. The next kind of thing that we need to talk about is how we prepare the infant for a lung ultrasound. And I can't emphasize enough, a lot of you have got prior scanning skills. You, you do echocardiography, you do uh, cranial ultrasounds. The optimizing and getting really good high quality images always means that when I do a lung ultrasound, I will always do it with somebody. I will not do it on my own. And the reason for that is when, when we try to obtain images, uh, in particular, if you're on your own and the baby's moving, you really risk the baby fighting your scans. If you don't swaddle the baby appropriately and keep them in certain positions, trying to get scans of uh, the right upper axilla and the left upper axilla can be incredibly challenging because of the way the baby's hands are kept. You'll need somebody to hold them. So if you want to get really good quality images, you need to think about infant containment. And I'm going to show you photographs of how this is done. But more importantly, you need to think of the position of your infant when you start scanning. Now, a lot of infants who are intubated will be supine, 
unless you're actively proning them. I know certainly for our extreme preterm babies, we try to handle them minimally for the first 72 hours. We keep them head end elevated. So actually proning them with lines is not something that we do. What is very important is that you would then be doing anterolateral scanning in that situation. But if you decided that you needed a comprehensive scan, the infant positioning may need to be changed. And for those of you who want to do the posterior regions, that might mean moving your infant into a lateral position. Uh, for a term baby who's not ventilated, you can actually turn them around. But please be aware, in order to allow physiology or gravity to allow the fluid to redistribute, you need to wait for a minimum of 30 to 60 minutes. That means you will leave that baby, go, and then have to come back. There is a way around this, and that's called scanning in the posterior axillary line. Now, if you scan in the posterior axillary line, you can get the posterior regions, but just be aware that getting good images of the plaps point, especially, and I'll, I'll talk to you about what the plaps point is for those of you who don't know, is the area posteriorly in between the scapula that area obviously is 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 quite important because uh, for a supine baby, kind of exudate, uh, I would say alveolar exudate, mnemonic kind of presentations can often take place by actually scanning that area. And there are babies where that might be the only area that's got a mnemonic presentation. Uh, what is also important is that if you are deciding to scan for lung recruitment, or to try and see if you can optimize ventilation in a supine baby. Naturally, it's the posterior areas that are gonna be atelectatic. Now, the question that you then have is, if you have well aerated anterior areas and you're increasing pressure for lung recruitment in a baby that's supine, then really the posterior areas is what you'd be looking at. So your infant positioning is quite crucial. And as we move through the course and cover each individual pathology, you'll get to understand why and how to position your infants. Now, I don't need sedatives and I've never used them unless this baby is very, very sick and there's going to be prolonged handling. Now, if you have a baby with severe pulmonary hypertension and you want to do a lung ultrasound scan and you think that that's gonna amount to a significant amount of handling, then an element of sedation may be clinically indicated. Actually, I, 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 you can do a lung ultrasound very quickly. And the important thing is you let the probe lie on the baby's chest. It lies. You never push hard. The more you push, especially in a baby like whose term, who is not ventilated, they will just fight back. You'll find that they will try to withdraw. Your images won't be of good quality. And really in situations like that, uh, what I would say is that uh, you'll run into trouble. The key thing from our perspective is how you contain the baby. And if you can contain the baby, now clearly uh, I'm just giving you this image over here. This lovely lady is doing uh, what is uh, a transfer scan in a rib area where the baby's actually playing with the, the actual probe. Now, that might make scanning quite difficult. So again, the question is how you're going to contain this baby and we'll, we'll talk about that. Again, for babies who are incredibly unstable, think about pre-oxygenation. I mean, is this a baby who's desaturating because he's got severe pulmonary hypertension? You might want to pre-oxygenate before you actually do uh, the scan. But for your extremely preterm babies, just remember hypothermia is a killer. And for those of you who are using uh, lung ultrasounds to determine whether you want to give surfactant. You know, uh, if you spend a long time trying to get those images, then really those babies are going to become cold very quickly. So it's very, very important that you, 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 you do these scans rapidly, effectively, and to try and get good image quality in the process. So let's make this a little bit interactive. We've talked about this image over here. So what is it that we can do in this particular situation? to optimize and help anybody. So you can see my cursor. Swaddle. Sorry? Swaddle. Okay, so if you swaddle this baby with say uh, a, a cloth or a, you know the, the nursing kind of, how are you going to do your scans? So we can hold the baby, uh, baby's arms, some uh, assistant can hold. Yep, so uh, w what are the problems here? One of the problems is obviously this baby is quite active. You can hold the arms. Is he going to like that? No. No. So he what I'd say, yeah. To play with. Yep. So you can give him something else to play with, or you can just 
if he's you can give him some sucrose with a pacifier, which will keep him interested, uh, which will divert his attention. But really, what I'd say is anterolateral scanning will not be a problem. You've got good exposure over here. This baby's anterior uh, kind of lateral regions are well exposed. To get into the right upper region and the left upper region, you will have to lift the arm and abduct it. And unless you do that, what will happen is you will not get good quality images. Uh, as I will show you uh, in coming weeks, often the images get cut. You miss the right apex. You miss the left apex. Now, the right apex is very important. It has the thymus. But more importantly, the thymus is something that people get very confused with and make uh, differentials of right upper lobe atelectasis collapse consolidation. Now, in a baby who has a tube down the right main bronchus, having a look at the right upper axilla, the right infraclavicular regions is very, very important. So again, you can see how important infant containment is. And for this baby, I'd probably try and get some sucrose, uh, have an assistant who's assisting me to try and get the hands out of the way when I want to do that. But more importantly, when I turn this baby around, uh, I'm going to have to wait half an hour to get the posterior regions because this baby has been supine. Now, what about if this baby's prone? What can I do? Anybody? So a few things that I can do is I can get the arms lifted and I can scan through the posterior axillary line. And that'll give me a significant view, especially if I'm doing what I call as longitudinal or perpendicular scanning of a significant amount of the lung areas and the lung spaces. Okay. What about the image on the right here? What's wrong with this? Exposure. Yeah, it's, it's a disaster. Can you imagine starting your scan? You probably get the anterior regions, but good luck trying to get the lateral and the posterior regions. But can you imagine if you start your scan, you then start undressing the baby, how upset you're going to make this baby? So, you know, this is, uh, I would call, you've started a scan without adequate exposure. Here, you have to be wary about the risk of hypothermia. Here, you have to be wary about the fact that you don't have adequate exposure. What about this image? Probe. Yeah. So this is an ideal image. Can you see how the baby's restrained? He's interested. He could be distracted with the pacifier and some sucrose. But this is ideal exposure for you. You can get your anterior regions. And really, when you want to do your lateral scannings, you, you just have to get that assistant of yours to lift the arms so that you can get into the lateral regions. And you can scan the back of the lungs through the posterior axillary line. So this is just a really good example of good exposure. Now, for term babies, again, if you're starting to use uh, and do a scan in a cot, which doesn't have adequate space, that can be a real challenge. Now, as you become more experienced, uh, I would say it becomes easier. But if you can't get into the lateral regions in a cot, you're not going to get good quality images. And anterolateral scanning is very important when you're trying to determine the extent of a pneumothorax and classify it as mild, moderate, or severe. Now, that obviously, I, I'm, I'm just going to give you an example here of how that affects your scan. A pneumothorax air rises anteriorly and laterally. Now, if you're trying to quantify whether this pneumothorax is mild, moderate, or severe, you're really looking at the extent of the pneumothorax up to the anterior and then to the posterior axillary line. Now, if you move your baby into a lateral position to try and get the lateral areas, naturally air will rise up into the lateral area and you will get really, uh, you will overestimate your pneumothorax. So again, Exposure is not just about having the baby exposed, but really, is the baby in a cot? Have you thought about how you're going to do this? What about moving a baby who has an evolving pneumothorax? These are all significant challenges. They create problems with how you scan. And we'll talk about how you can make this better. So just another simple example that I'll give you here is if, 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 if you want to go into the anterior and lateral regions alone and you're scanning for a pneumothorax, you'd still need to expose this baby and really getting into the upper axilla here to try and look for the regions which are R3, R4, and L3, L4 will be very difficult with this way this baby is exposed. You need to have good full exposure. So this is containment for you. And this is just an example of a term baby within uh, the incubator. I mean, some of you will use open air resuscitators and uh, 
this is a really nice example of containment over here. So the baby basically uh, has one arm that's held uh, by the nurse, other arm that can be held by the nurse, but really you're scanning the anterior areas. And when you come to scanning the, the lateral area, the nurse just has to hold the right hand, pick it up. And that means you can scan the lateral area and you can scan through the posterior axillary line. But again, the key to containment is making sure that you have an assistant who is happy to help you, but I can't emphasize enough getting good high quality images is about your comfort again what height you keep the scanner at uh, in relation to the incubator all of these things is really important because if you're uncomfortable uh, and i cannot emphasize this enough my job here is not just to uh, teach you it's to make you good scanners what will happen is you will press hard the more hard you press the more the baby will fight and it will try and move away from your probe. And what you'll get is you'll get a lot, lot, loss of contact. And really, if you have air between the probe and the baby, then you can easily think you might have a pneumothorax, you'll get a barcode sign. So really, from my perspective, it's really important that you, you think about how you're scanning levels, your comfort, the baby's comfort. But can you see how this baby, movement, all of these things, it's not going to make your scans easy. But holding that hand, that right upper hand, just in this particular situation, keeping the baby distracted using sucrose can keep your baby still, but can actually improve your image quality. Again, just another example. Can you see how holding the hand benefits? So again, scanning the anterior, and the lateral region would really involve you having to try and lift this arm. You need to lift it, it needs to be abducted. Otherwise you're not going to be able to get into the right upper axilla to do R1, R2. I cannot emphasize this enough. And what happens when you push too hard? So when you push too hard, babies become uncomfortable and no amount of swaddling or trying to give them sucrose is going to help. Respiratory distress gets worse. The baby, it's not good for the baby, but more importantly, for you as a scanner, really what happens is you tend to lose contact with the probe and the baby. So it's really important. This is a hockey stick. It should lie on the baby with good contact. You should not be pressing. The more you press, the, the more the baby will fight and you will get really, really, really poor images. So sedatives, not necessary for big term babies, near term babies, for the preterm babies who are not ventilated where it's safe, use sucrose. If, if, you know, for the bigger babies who can suck, use a pacifier, use common sense, have somebody who's going to help you do these scans. This is trouble, this is real trouble. There's nobody helping this poor person. Now, can you see how the baby fights the hand? It's, it's going to interfere with your ability to keep the probe in the right place. But more importantly, who's keeping an eye on the baby? Now, if this is a baby who's intubated, ventilated, and nobody's keeping an eye on the baby, sats are dropping, and this baby accidentally extubates, you'll be in big trouble. So this is, in my opinion, the most important step of lung ultrasound scanning. And more than doing an echo, more than doing a cranial ultrasound, good high quality images are produced if you plan, you position, you expose, and you contain. And if you do that properly, you will get very good images. In terms of infection control, just use your local protocols. We use Clinel wipes between patients. When we clean, we clean from the probe right up to the entire, uh, I would say, wire that we think is gonna go into the incubator. So it's really important that you clean that particular area between babies. Uh, for infection control in our setup, uh, if I'm using a scanner and I've handled a baby, not only will I clean uh, my, my ultrasound machine, uh, the probe, I will hand wash and I will use gloves as appropriate if there's exposure to body fluids, you know, if there's any blood or anything out there. So local protocol could be clinel wipes. Some of you may have crystal wipes that you're using which are specifically designed for ultrasound machines. They're quite expensive, but now set up Clinel is more than sufficient. Uh, any questions so far? Any questions that you want to ask me? Any tips that you want to share? Any of you who are scanning? Anything that works for you? Anybody? 
Okay. Now, can I ask, uh, so how do you choose the frequency of the probe? Anybody? Based on the maturity of the PP and the area I am going to check. Okay, that's beautiful. Excellent. Anybody else? Depends on the maturity gestation of the baby, whether it is term or a preterm. Okay. We change, or if it's an infant, we okay. select the frequency. Okay, so I'm just curious. I mean, the term preterm is very, there's a very wide range. 22 weeks up till, you know, 37 weeks. So 36 weeks is preterm, 24 weeks is preterm, 32 weeks is preterm, uh, 37 weeks and above is term. But, weight uh, of the baby and uh, the physique. Okay. Is there any evidence for weight of the baby? Have you read any articles about that? Um, no, sir. Like, if the weight is more, we need a lower frequency. And if the weight is uh, very less, we need a higher frequency to see the superficial. Because the chest is very thin, so we need uh, we can do with the higher frequency so that uh, resolution is better. Okay. So, I mean, yes, I would, I would agree with you. Now, I've sent you an article, I'll send you two more, all of which are very good. But most of the work that's kind of been published on this has been done by Dr. Liu and Dr. Kuripa. And really what we talk about is for all babies, we tend to use high frequency probes. And naturally, the reason for that is the lungs are very superficial. We're going to look at a very superficial region of uh, the baby's chest to try and get a good quality image. So naturally, when we talk about using a high frequency, uh, the, the, the wavelength, the depth of penetration will be much lower and it'll interact with superficial tissues to give you a good image. But really what I'd say is what's described in the literature is for preterm babies. And my, my experience says that for babies below 32 weeks, I would be using frequencies of between 12 and 15 hertz. Uh, at the same time, for babies over 32 weeks, I'd be using frequencies of between 9 to 12. For big term babies, frequencies of 10 are, are good. But what is really important is that when you talk about frequency alone, and I'm just talking about frequency, I'm not talking about probe, you have to rely on the machine you're using. And every machine is different. Indeed, I'm going to say to you that a machine that's 10 years old will be different to a machine that is brand new, uh, will be different to the kind of modern machines where modern machines tend to reduce artifact. And actually from our perspective, because of this issue of reducing artifact, we tend to find fewer A and B lines, which makes diagnosis much more difficult. What is important from our perspective is that when you have your probe in your machine, there are two ways to scan. One way to scan is to scan neat by selecting your probe, which could either be a hockey stick or a linear probe, and we'll talk about that. But more importantly, from our perspective, selecting a preset frequency. And what I'd normally do is that if I have a baby under 32 weeks, under 1500 grams, I tend to default to using a frequency of, and starting with a frequency of 12, and then adjusting the frequency to try and make and optimize my image better. On the other hand, when I have a baby who, say, for example, is uh, uh, term, I tend to want to use a lower frequency. And what I know is that my hockey stick doesn't allow me to have a frequency of 10. So I tend to default to using my linear probe, which does allow a frequency of 10. Now, not only that, but what I would say is that alongside the frequency, there are other parameters that I can enhance to optimize my image without playing with the frequency. And we'll talk about that. That's the focus, the depth, and the gain. Now, in terms of what probe you're going to select, I just want to give you an example. I love using the linear probe that you can see on the right-hand side, and I like using it cross gestation. My linear probe actually allows me to have frequencies between uh, 10 to up to 15. And the biggest advantage with the linear probe is you can see what geographical area it covers. It covers the entire anterior part of the chest, multiple rib spaces. Now, in an extremely preterm baby, I can pretty much see the whole of R1 and R2. Maybe I need an additional image to kind of look higher up to have a look at the thymus. But, you know, for a 23 weeker who's 500 grams, this probe will pretty much cover everything. And if I can alter the frequency to get a higher frequency to give me better images, 
I would tend to prefer using a linear probe, but I can't guarantee that that will give you good images in your setup. So usually the dictum is that for extremely preterm babies and or babies say under 1500 grams is what we've decided as per our protocol, we tend to using the, the, the hockey stick, which gives us higher frequencies up to 15. So they're up to 17 Hertz in some institutes. And really what I'd say is for extremely preterm babies, you do need higher frequencies to see the more superficial areas in a, in a much better way. So a, a rule of thumb, I, I need to give you something to work with. And a rule of thumb would say that for babies under 1500 grams, you can use the hockey stick. It has a smaller footprint, which kind of means that when you're doing scans, you will use a 12 region method, which is R1, R2, R3, R4. We'll talk about that. And then the back R5, R6. Now that would be for a near term baby, maybe a baby who's 32 weeks. But if you have a baby who say, for example, is 500 grams, you might find that this probe pretty much covers the whole of the anterior part of the chest. And rather than using uh, a 12 region method, actually using a six region method will give you all the information you need. And then you will have to change your terminology accordingly. So in that, what you'd be doing is R1, R2, R3, simply based on the size of the chest. Now, between you and me, you can use a linear probe if it's got decent frequencies for all your scans, whether the baby's extremely preterm, preterm, or term. If you have a hockey stick in the learning phase, I would ask you to experiment with both and to look and see how you image optimize. That brings me to the second part of the talk, which is presets. Now, presets are basically settings that you allow for lung ultrasound, which says I can have a term preset, which sets my frequency at nine, sets my depth at about four to five centimeters, sets uh, my, my speckle reduction to about two, and allows me where I need to have a focus point at the level of the pleura. I can set this up to a preset for a term baby, but for a preterm baby who has a smaller chest, I'm actually going to go for a smaller depth of three centimeters, a higher frequency, maybe starting at 12, so that I can use the hockey stick or use the linear probe as I want. Now you can have these presets and the way to do that is if you don't already have a good relationship with the people who run and help you with your machine, which is technically uh, the people who uh, kind of are the company uh, personnel, then you need to build that relationship because you'll need presets for everything. And having a preset makes life much, much easier for you. Not only that, you can alter a preset and optimize your image simply by clicking on it. So it's really helpful to have a preset. But when you're learning, I would say that, especially in the next two weeks, for those of you who are having trouble, come back to me. And as we see your images, we'll try and see how we might be able to optimize them based on your scan scanner. So not based on my scanner, because my scanner will have different buttons and different settings. Any questions about frequencies and probes? Any questions? Can I ask a quick question? Please. Would you use a face array probe because it's smaller and you can get, get between, between rib spaces? Yes. So you can. You can use a phase array probe. Now, what I'd say is that if you look at the, the hockey stick, that can get through very small rib spaces without any problems. But more importantly, because it's got uh, length, actually, it'll give you a much larger footprint. Now, if you use a phase array probe, you can, you can. The challenge with the phase array probe is it often makes the pleura quite small because it's got this kind of a configuration. So really, you just have to be aware of the fallacies that you might be interpreting pleura very superficially. And it might be tricky when you're trying to interpret sliding and subpleural consolidations, which are very superficial. Again, altering your frequency and altering the width. So you can alter in some machines, you can alter the width that you get with the phase array probe to make it as wide as possible. And that's what, what I would do. Pretty much, I would say, uh, if you don't have anything, then you can use a sector probe or you can use the convex probe. And we will show you images and teach you how to interpret using a convex probe. Some of you will. Please do not feel disheartened if you don't have a linear probe or you don't have a hockey stick. You can pretty much do and use convex probes and phase array probes to do your lung ultrasound as long as you know the limitations. Any other questions? 
Okay, I'm just going to move because we've discussed probes. Frequency and nature. Now, I've covered this. So just a rough kind of a view. You can use a linear, you can use a hockey stick, but if you don't have anything, then you can use the sector or the convex or phase array probe. This is a phase array probe. Again, it'll have a large footprint, but naturally the images will change slightly. Uh, for preterm frequencies, 12 to 15. Term, you can use 9 to 11. You'll alter frequency to try and optimize your image. But just to give you an idea of why I talked uh, about the different probes. So this is a linear probe for you. And you can see how many spaces can I see. So in a standard view, I need to have two intercostal spaces as a bare minimum. Now, this is basically a linear probe in a transverse view. One, two, three, four, five. It's giving me a huge footprint. Not only is it giving me a huge footprint, but really for a baby, if I get this area, you know, I've got half the chest. So I can actually do these two images relatively easily to give me a huge amount of information. Now I can see Plura very crisply over here. I can also see what looks like a double lung point, this area that looks a little bit more wet. This is more well aerated. Now, when I clinically correlate this, Looks like TTN to me if I have the right history. But if I do the same image with a convex probe, uh, actually using, uh, I would say, the same frequency, can you see how seeing the plura becomes less well-defined? You see a smaller footprint. But more importantly, because the ultrasound waves are going like this and reflecting back, you have a huge area of dropout. So you're losing depth. You're only seeing the superficial area. But really, this looks like well aerated lung. So it can alter your interpretation. And that's why I would say clinical correlation is absolutely key. Ideally, if you have a linear probe or a hockey stick, I would try to use it. Now, the challenge with using a hockey stick, so if I'm using a hockey stick here, it's really tricky because I might just be able to get maybe two intercostal spaces and three ribs with a hockey stick. So I might have to take multiple views of the anterior and lateral chest to actually make sure that I've got enough geography, especially if I'm doing a, a, a comprehensive scan to diagnose a pneumonia. And those are the disadvantages of a hockey stick in a big baby. It gives you a very small geographical footprint. It makes it very difficult for you to kind of have to scan and do comprehensive extended scans. Just going forwards again, impact of probe. So this is just an example of the change in frequency. Now, clearly from our perspective, we're using uh, a machine, a high-end machine. So these are the more modern machines like a GE that you might have. And these are the older machines that we use. Now, if you're using a very old probe, which technically from our perspective tends to leave out artifact, then clearly from our kind of diagnosis, uh, you, you can end up making the wrong diagnosis. This is the same baby using an old low-end machine with very poor resolution where you don't have a high frequency. And because you don't have a high frequency, you can't see the superficial areas of the lung very well. Now, this baby basically has got multiple rib spaces where there is a snowflake appearance, subplural consolidation with compact B lines. Now, this is classical RDS. But in this particular picture, not only can I not see the snowflake sign and the subplural consolidations, because the frequency that's being used in this machine is quite low. I've got good depth, but I cannot see the compact B lines. And this would make me think that this baby's got basically a white lung, more in keeping with a diagnosis, maybe of TTN. So it can actually alter how you make the diagnosis as well. And this is really important. Uh, again, just another example. So if you look at the image on the left-hand side, so that's an image by a linear transducer using a low frequency, whereas the image on the right-hand side is a linear transducer using a frequency of more than 10. Now, if you look at this, because you're able to see, now in respiratory distress syndrome, as I'll describe to you, the diagnosis is met by seeing subplural consolidations that you can see over here, these small white areas. Now, if you can't see these, then really from your perspective, you're not going to make a diagnosis of respiratory distress syndrome. Using a lower frequency, which gives you better depth, which you can't see over here, 
means that you can't actually delineate with accuracy the subplural area and see subplural consolidations. And that means that in this case, you'll think this baby is actually well aerated with respiratory distress. Really, what's wrong over here? Because it doesn't add up. Uh, if you can't see sliding, you might think this baby's had a pneumothorax. So again, the use of appropriate frequency for the appropriate baby is crucial. It is key. A rough rule of thumb, if you're if you're doing and using a probe, a linear probe uh, as a standard, starting with a frequency of 10 in a term baby. Uh, and if you want to see more depth, you can reduce your frequency to get more depth. Alternatively, you can increase the depth. Now, normally in a term baby, you want a minimum of four to five centimeters and a preterm baby up to three centimeters is good. A real problem is that if you try to increase depth too much, then the ultrasound waves cannot penetrate and you end up with these areas that are dark or completely black or even completely white. And basically it just means that you're getting no information in those areas. Okay. Any uh, questions? Hello. Yeah. The okay. image on the right, uh, you said that that, that that looks like consolidation. Subtle. Now I just wanted to get my concept right. Hmm. Within a B line, can you ever see an A line? Okay, that's a really, really good question because theoretically people would have you believe that when you have established B lines, A lines get obliterated. Can I just say to you that that's not actually the case? It depends on what your B lines are like. So you can see if there's aerated lung. So when lungs aerate, if you take a deep breath, naturally you'll see A lines because the pleura gets established. But if the same baby then expires, you might see interstitial space go up and you can see B lines. So yes, books will have you believe that if you have B profile and B lines, you may not see A lines. Actually, uh, what you'll find is these small areas here are probably A lines. So, yeah. I mean, just that the, the middle column with the B line, I don't know. I It looks like an A line to me rather than a consolidation. How do you figure out that that's a... A consolidation. Okay. Uh, should we talk about that with RDS? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I will talk about it with RDS, the grades of it. And what I'd say is what you really want to differentiate them from is comet tails. Uh, they will usually be diffuse. Uh, they will usually be in multiple areas. And if you go to the back of the lung, they'll be quite bad. So with time, you'll become very experienced in being able to differentiate them. Right. Okay, so just to carry on. Okay, so how do we scan? So there are two kinds of scans. There is what I would call, we're gonna use standard terminology over here. Standard, I'm gonna go through nomenclature. Abhijit will cover it next Sunday. I will also cover some of it on Thursday, but really from my perspective, what is really important is we're gonna use the terminology perpendicular and parallel. It's just easy to remember. Perpendicular scanning is the standard scanning, anterolateral scanning that you do. Uh, you basically scan perpendicular to the ribs. And what it gives you is this classical, I would say, bat wing sign, two ribs. So, so ribs, rib acoustic shadow, and pleura. So the classical bat wing sign that you should be able to see. It will allow you to see pleura and it will give you good depth into the lung. With parallel scanning, you're scanning between ribs. And really, again, what I'd say is using a linear probe with a very large footprint may sometimes make it difficult to get in between rib spaces. A hockey stick is easier to do. Naturally, from our perspective, uh, so, uh, in, in bigger babies, you can get uh, phase array probes and sector probes within ribs as well. But the important thing is the majority of your scanning will be perpendicular scanning. And there's sufficient evidence to show that perpendicular scanning alone will help you and allow you to make the diagnosis in a large number of conditions without the need to do the posterior zones. And a good example is a pneumothorax. So in a supine baby, a pneumothorax is going to be anterolateral. So actually, it doesn't make sense to scan the posterior zones unless you feel you, you're worried about a diagnosis of pneumonia. Now you can imagine in a baby who's got evolving pneumothorax, that is, that is your clinical point of interest. That is what you want to diagnose. That is what you might want to treat. That's what you might have time for. 
you know, on an extremely preterm baby, then doing the posterior regions is going to waste time for you. And that's where I would say that you need to be pragmatic about the approach. Parallel scans will give you soft tissue. They will give you a rib, which is seen longitudinally. They'll give you a plural line, and then they give you geography or a footprint that is that individual intercostal space. Now, you might want to do that because you have a consolidation that's visible in one of these spaces, and you want to delineate that consolidation better. So usually parallel scanning is done when we do a comprehensive or an extended scan. And I will talk about those terminologies. But this is how the anatomy is visualized. Again, just an example of perpendicular scanning. Perpendicular scanning is done at right angles to the rib space. Uh, this is a good example of how you do perpendicular scanning with the baby in prone position. Again, I don't want the baby to move. So what I like to do is I like to keep the hands of the baby underneath. I've straddled him in a nest so that he's not going to move too much. And I'm just going to let the probe lie. I'm going to take the scapula out of the equation and move medially so that I can get my lung. And this is what it looks like. So you get a large number of rib spaces. Now, very importantly, this is the anterior. A here basically is looking at the anterior region. Now, B, I've moved this baby over. It's more wet, but you have a lot more soft tissue at the back sometimes, and that can actually affect your image quality. So it's important. Now, if I'm struggling in this situation and I'm using a high frequency, I might be using a frequency of 12 to 14. This baby's under 32 weeks. Now, I'm going to get the superficial areas, but I'm not getting the deeper areas. So to do that, the two things that I can do is I can either change my focus, which is at the level of the pleura to a deeper region, or I might want to use and drop the frequency to try and make a delineation. But if this baby fights, then I have loss of contact. And when I have loss of contact, my image quality suffers. And this is really what is happening in this image over here. Because this baby is uncomfortable, it's fighting. I'm having loss of contact and I'm having less penetration of ultrasound, which is naturally affecting my ability to make an interpretation over here. So it's really important. Keep it comfortable for the baby. Keep it comfortable for yourself. Now, how do we scan? And what regions do we use? It's very simple. So for babies who are over 1,500 grams, over 32 weeks, uh, and I don't have an article that references it, but this has been my practice for the last five, six years. We have an, a, a midline that moves through the midpoint of the ziphoid process in the sternum. You have a line that basically moves through the anterior axillary line and a line that moves through the posterior axillary line. So basically you classify them by, and we I use the terminology by number. Some people like to use right upper, right lower. I as a standard terminology, use numbers. And if I'm doing the 12 region method, we have R1, R2, we have R3, R4, and then R5 and R6 at the back. Now for the back, it's the posterior axillary line and it's the spine. And there's a large area over here. What you want to do is avoid the scapula. But in extremely small babies, under 32 weeks, as you'd know, this is for babies over 1,500 grams and over 32 weeks, you're using the 12 region method because your footprint with a hockey stick or a linear probe would not necessarily cover this entire region in one view. For babies under 32 weeks who are extremely small, actually your linear probe would cover the entire region. You can get everything in one image, R1, R2, right up to the diaphragm. And for them, they talk about using a six region method. So what is a six region method? It basically says that you will classify this as R1, the lateral region as R2, and the posterior region as R3. So one probe covering all these regions. And when you use Bratz score, literally, you are looking at anterolateral scanning alone. So you can use a six region method in babies who are less than 32 weeks, less than 1500 grams. Any confusion? Anybody want to ask me any questions about this? Because this is the standard that we'll be using. Uh, sir, in the six region techniques, did you say R1 is anterior, R2 is lateral area, and R3 is posterior? Yeah, that's the terminology that I use as a standard. 
I have no problems with you saying right anterior, right lateral, and right posterior. I don't have any problems with that. But for all practical purposes, when you develop your guideline, please make it obvious in your guideline how you're going to label and interpret regions. Because clearly from your perspective, if you're doing a scan in the morning in a baby less than 1500 grams, less than 32 weeks, and decide that I'm going to use the six region method, and somebody then decides in the afternoon that actually they're going to use the 12 region method, the way you're going to report scans and interpret them may be significantly different. So for your protocol and your guideline, and in my guideline that I will share with you, We've clearly mentioned that when we use the 12 region method, we will number it R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6 on the right, which is basically upper and lower regions. But if we're using the six region method, the whole of the front is called R1. We can use upper, lower if you want. Lateral region is R2 and the posterior region is R3. And whenever I write my report, I always write, am I using the six or 12 region method? If you want to use the 12 region method for everything, I have no problems. You can use it. You can have one linear probe, which basically lies and it covers the entire anatomy, but you can say that's actually R1, R2. And my personal view is that's acceptable as well. So in six region techniques, what I knew till now that mm -hmm. uh, uh, those three regions on either side are one is anterior, upper, anterior i mean lower and the lateral yeah, yeah. that's bad score that's bad scoring you're using bats method so that is you're right it's right anterior upper uh, right anterior lower and lateral so i'll come to that my advice to you is we should use standardized terminology for the purposes of this course my advice would be use the 12 region method and classify them as r1 r2 R3, R4, L1, L2, L3, L4. And for the purposes of peer review, that's all I need. That's all I need at the moment. I don't want you to do comprehensive scans unless you think they're clinically indicated. While you're learning, I just want you to use that. For BRAT score, what we'd be doing is looking at R1, R2, and basically looking at either R3 or R4 or the whole of it as a whole. Okay, happy with that. So okay. the 12 region, uh, does it include the posterior also or is it uh, only under lateral scan? No, no, no. The 12 region method is going to have the posterior. So again, I we need to make sure that you understand this. So how do we classify 12 regions? So we classify 12 regions by a line that goes through the ziphi sternum vertically. Okay, a line through the anterior axillary, posterior axillary line and a line through the midline of the spine. So really what you've got is R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, which is the back. So uh, the back regions are R5, R6. So six on the right and six on yeah, the left. Okay. That's okay, 12. Sir. Six region method is, again, it's all areas. It is anterior, lateral, and posterior. But all it's saying is that you have an extremely small baby. So actually, you can just have one, two, three on this side and one, two, and three on the other side. My my advice to you is just use the 12 region method for everything. Okay. Um, hello. Yeah. Um, we tend to use uh, our main machine. Uh, the Epic has got a large probe and we don't have a hockey stick probe on it. Uh, we sometimes wheel out the Sono site, which has got a hockey probe. Mm -hmm. So... We use a very large linear probe, which covers the entire region in one go. Hmm. Um, it is tricky to use, and we are trying to buy a hockey stick probe for Just our... relax. Just use a linear probe. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely uh, fine. Is it okay for your peer reviews that we just do, you know, uh, if I use the six region method for most of our... I have absolutely no problems. I have absolutely no problems. Uh, what I'd say is the beauty of it is use. is we'll use everything. People, yeah. there will be people here who don't have a hockey stick or don't have a linear probe. We will use that as well. Mm -hmm. And this is what is important is that you can make a diagnosis with them as long as you know the limitations. But what I'd say is for reporting protocol, when you develop your guideline, please, ex mm -hmm. you can see how much, how confusing it is. Transverse, longitudinal, the terminologies are massive. My advice is stick to one terminology and try to stick to 
one one either the six or the twelve region method. Having both of them creates a lot of confusion. The six in a big baby will be a little bit tricky. Any other questions before we move on? I'm really glad you guys are asking questions. For me, I just felt the group was very quiet last time. Now, just in terms of the probe marker, so how do we organize the probe marker? So just remember, your probe marker is always cranial. So it's always, so if you're doing scanning, that is scanning that's perpendicular, your probe marker will always be towards the head. It's cranial orientation. For longitudinal scanning, what I would say is your probe marker should always be towards the right shoulder. So at this particular point, this is wrong. This is There's a good reason why I'm showing this image. Can you see this image? So this, this probe marker should be towards the right shoulder. So actually from my perspective, just remember, if I'm holding the probe marker, sorry, this is correct actually, because the baby's prone. So you, this marker should always move towards the right shoulder. And where is the probe marker on the right side, the image? Uh, so this is not the image that corresponds to this probe. So you can't see it, yeah, my apologies. But when I, when I show you some scans next time, I'll be able yeah. to explain it to you. The important thing from your perspective is it just means you know, where pathology is in relation to your probe marker, and it's always towards the right. This and is not. Hello. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Is parallel or transverse probe uh, views a, a part of your normal guidelines? Like, do you always do it? No, no. I'm coming to that, Praveen. Mm -hmm. I, I'll cover that. Okay. So, parallel scanning or kind of each intercostal space means that you're going to have to do each intercostal space anteriorly, laterally, and posteriorly. It's a massive amount of handling. Massive. And again, what I'd say to you is you will get a huge amount of information by transfer scanning alone. So there has to be valid clinical indications for it. Now, in terms of kind of the fourth view, now, <clears throat> recent class classifications have talked about uh, basically doing infra or subdiaphragmatic, transdiaphragmatic scanning. And the idea is to obtain that really what you want to do is you want to keep the situs view that you'd normally keep for your echocardiography and then put your probe under the rib spaces. Now, this is the one that is incorrect because really what you want to do is you want to keep this probe towards the right shoulder. So we need to turn this around. But really what you'd be doing, if you look at me, is holding your probe over here. Can you see me? Can all of you see me? Can you see me? No. Okay. Yeah. So you're keeping your probe over here. And really what you're doing is subdiaphragmatic scanning. So you're moving your probe like this and like this. But just remember the probe marker should always be towards the right shoulder. So it might be that your probe marker is like this and like this. And that'll give you the lower part of the diaphragm. It's really, really good for looking at pleural effusions. Be wary of having mirror image artifact. We'll show you images of it. But uh, transdiaphragmatic scanning is good for looking at pleural effusions and looking for the, you know, the subdiaphragmatic region. It's really good if you want to look for an extraversation or a collection under the liver. So under the diaphragm, over the liver. Okay. I'm sorry, Sharma, just a quick question, please. Yes, please. So yes. for the parallel scanning, we always point the pointer to the right side, whether it's like in front or at the back. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So just another example. Again, so this is the left shoulder. So my marker, unfortunately, is towards the left shoulder. It should be the opposite way. It should be pointing towards the right shoulder. Do you get what I'm saying? So we need to turn this probe around 180 degrees so that the marker, which is this end, points towards that shoulder. Personally, between you and me, it'll still give you the same image, but that's protocol for you. Okay, we've talked about the six region method. Again, simple, anterior, posterior, and lateral areas. It's the same markers, midline, anterior axillary, posterior axillary, and then the spine. Just in an extremely preterm baby, the probe will cover this entire area. So because it covers the entire area, 
the three region method is just as valid. And if you want to kind of decide on whether you want to give surfactant to the baby using BRAT score, you're only going to use the anterior region, divide it into upper and lower, and the lateral region. Again, there is you know a, a lot of talk about the lateral region being quite large and how you interpret images, but we'll we'll talk about that at that time. Okay. Also Any questions? Question. Please. Yes, sir. Yeah. So in this picture where uh, you have shown as the posterior region, hmm. where do we exactly keep the uh, probe? Is it just near to the posterior axillary line or yeah. near to the just on line? the posterior axillary line and directing it posteriorly? You can sweep. You can sweep up and down. So I will take a video of me doing a scan and I'll be able to show it to you. So really, if you look at me, like for the baby who's lying supine, if you want to do the back, so you're doing the front transverse, you're doing lateral transverse, but for the posterior region, you can actually just keep the probe on the posterior axillary line with the baby supine, as you can see. And that actually means that you can sweep forwards and backwards to kind of have a good look at the posterior zones of the lung through the posterior axillary line. It needs experience, but with experience, you become better at being able to do it. Okay. So it's not in the spine, sir, like in the two marks. Sorry? So the posteriorly, when we keep the probe, it is not near the spine. It is near the posterior axillary line. So okay. if the baby, if you want to do it with the baby supine, but okay. if you want and can turn the baby over as you've done over here, then you will naturally get a better view by actually keeping the probe in this region with the baby prone. But if you have a 500 gram baby, you know, and you want to see the posterior regions, are you really with umbilical lines and all of that intubated, ventilated, going to put him prone in the first two hours of life? If he's not tubed and he's on CPAP, you can. But again, I'm just thinking of the handling, 22 weekers, breaking doors, 23 weekers. I mean, it's, it's real trouble. Your golden hour basically is everything plus targeted head and targeted lung. And that decides whether you want to then give surfactant if they're not intubated. In our units, we tube everything at that gestation. Is that clear, Surjeet? Yes, sir. Yes. Amazing. Okay. Any other questions? I've covered this. So this is Bratz scoring. And Bratz scoring, basically, from our perspective, is a score that's been developed by Rosalind Bratt and Nadia Yusuf. Uh, they basically have done a study which looks and classifies this score and correlates it with an outcome of need for surfactant based on uh, prospective follow-up of the babies. And really what they found is that once you kind of hit a score of above eight, based on scores of one, zero to three, uh, based on the appearance of the lung, the higher score correlates with an outcome of RDS that went on to need surfactant in the study. So really the way they do that score is by scanning the anterior and lateral regions because extremely preterm babies, they didn't want to handle it. And really what they do is they divide the anterior region into upper and lower. They add these two scores and the lateral region. And really, if the score totals more than eight, then in that particular situation, the sensitivity for pickup and diagnosis of RDS with a view to giving surfactant might be something that you might want to do. But again, there's a detailed talk on that. They're only using anterior lateral regions. And they felt the study was actually valid for babies between 24 and 34 weeks of gestation. And actually, just as valid for the extreme preterms as it was for the near near term babies. But just be aware that babies who are near term, or you know, 30, 32 weeks, you might have them prone. Now, if they're prone, you can actually apply BRAT score by doing exactly the same. So, the people used to think that you can't do BRAT score while the baby's prone. That's not correct. You can use the posterior regions and divide them into upper and lower and add to lateral and use the same score. And it's been validated in a study. So really, it's easy, and it uses anterior lateral or posterior lateral scanning. That brings me to the most important thing, which a lot of you have asked today. And that really, from my perspective, is what and what are the indications for scanning, and how much do you scan? 
well, really, scanning may be anterolateral alone, and it may help as when you're trying to make a diagnosis for a pneumothorax. Uh, it might be useful if you're deciding on surfactant test for BRAT score. And actually, it might involve only perpendicular scans. So the question is, where would you do a comprehensive scan? All six or all 12 regions uh, and perpendicular scans. And a good example from my perspective is if I have a baby who comes to me with respiratory distress and I look at and I do the ultrasound and the anterolateral regions look normal. They look completely well aerated. Well, I've got nothing in these regions to explain what this baby's pathology is. I then need to look at the posterior zones. And in the posterior zone, if you pick up a consolidation with a fractal sign, and this mother has a history of prolonged rupture of membranes and group B strep, well, that could be a congenital pneumonia for you then. So I'd say that if you don't have information sufficient enough based on your, your, your anterolateral scanning to give you a diagnosis, then really what you need to do is do a comprehensive scan, a perp which are, again, all perpendicular scans. But if you still have no information, then really you then will need to do each intercostal space. Now, it's unusual in my experience that you have to do that, but simple examples that I'll give you of needing an extended comprehensive scan is if I've got a consolidation that I've seen in the posterior region and I don't have a feel for whether it has factual sign, then I might, if the baby is you know, stable enough, go and start scanning each individual intercostal space to quantify the extent of the consolidation. Like an X-ray will tell you how big this area is. An X-ray will not tell you whether this is anterior, posterior. Similarly, again, if I have a baby who has significant atelectasis who I want to recruit, then actually recruitment maneuvers based on studies have, have been done based on scanning in each intercostal space to try and recruit lung to see that that area is actually being well recruited. So my experience is extended comprehensive scanning, whilst not commonly practiced, may be needed in situations where you can't explain any reason for why this baby is developing respiratory distress. And if your lung ultrasound is completely normal and a baby has respiratory distress, well, it might be elevated pulmonary pressures, pulmonary hypertension, then you're really talking about doing an echo. So again, what I'd say to you is that you have to decide what the indication for the scan is. And that brings me to the next topic, which is very important. So it's storage, documentation, and reporting. Now, simple things. If you have decided that you are going to do a scan and the indication, and you've then decided that you're going to do an anterolateral scan, a comprehensive scan, or an extended comprehensive scan, I would be clearly documenting the indication for the scan, why I'm going to do that scan. And the intention then from my perspective is that all the images that I take for those regions, R1, R2, R3, R4, R5, R6, and on the left side, have to be stored separately as individual clips. Each intercostal space has to be stored separately as an individual clip. For an extremely preterm baby, if you get enough footprint, you can combine them into one, but you then need to make sure that they're labeled appropriately. Now, that's a lot of images. Like if you look at a head scan, it's 10 images, you know, uh, front to back, it's 11, six plus five. But actually, if you start looking at doing an extended comprehensive scan, we're talking about the 12 region method with 12 different clips. Uh, you're talking about each intercostal space, which is at least 11 spaces on the right and left. And then you're talking lateral and posterior. I mean, your machine will probably have a heart attack. Uh, I, th I think the people who are paying for it will have an even bigger heart attack. But that's where I would say that governance would say that you need to store those clips separately. Uh, and they need to be stored in a manner that allows the subsequent person to be able to interpret them if he's planning to do a serial scan. Now, those protocols will vary based on whether you have electronic systems for storage or whether you have a paper system for storage. If you have a paper system for storage, still clips will be the only thing. You can't store loops. So a paper system, in my experience, is, I would say, it's, it's reasonable, but for looking at sliding, trying to diagnose a pneumothorax, unless you can demonstrate a barcode sign on that piece of paper, it's, it's useless. So you have to, and we've developed in the guideline governance around how you store images, how you discuss with 
you're radiologists, but you need to have protocols for how you plan to store the images that you agree as a group amongst yourselves so that you can report in a uniform way. More importantly, how do you report? Now, really, if you're using a 12 region method, my standard approach, and I will be sharing that with you today, is when I start performing any lung ultrasound scan, I look for the backwing sign in that region. I then look for the pleura sliding. I talk about what the pleura looks like in terms of normalcy, abnormalcy. We then do and classify as per nomenclature what the profile is. I'm not covering that today. That will be covered by Abhijit next time. But more importantly, once I've commented on the profile, we ideally should do, if you're doing sliding, M mode for each region. Now, if you can see sliding, that's very fairly obvious. M mode might not give you additional information. But if I'm confused about sliding, I will always go into M mode because it's a really good marker of whether there is sliding or not. Uh, you then have to kind of talk about the presence of A or B lines, comet tails, presence of consolidation or absence of consolidation and effusion. And then what we classify as signs and lines. So you might have other signs. You, you, on the M mode, you might want to look for sinusoidal sign. If you have a prudal effusion, you might have the jellyfish sign. So you'd need to document them. But really what you have to do is, is make a report that talks about the profile in all the regions. Now to make it simple, because you could end up writing an essay on this, we use a standard reporting form which was developed by the last batch. It keeps patient details, gestation weight, talks about the indication for the scan, which probe you used with what frequency, very important. Because if you're changing frequency as I've highlighted to you, or you're changing probe, you will interpret things differently. My advice is, if you're doing serial scanning, you should be using the same probe, the same frequency. Acknowledge scan limitations. I mean, if this is a baby who was too vigorous and your image quality was poor, acknowledge it. But really what you can do is you can use some simple ticks to kind of justify lung sliding in all regions. You can talk about the pleura being normal or abnormal in all regions. Again, we use a standardized kind of N for normal, but if it's abnormal, we'll write, well, what was it? Thick, blurred, continuous, non-continuous. We'll then talk about the profile, M mode appearance. So really using this form, you can, you can write a report very quickly, but at the end of it, really, you need to conclude what your clinical impression and clinical sonographic impression is. So really, again, you don't want to make a diagnosis of meconium aspiration at 30 days of age in a baby who's kind of collapsed in in your special care because it's very unlikely to be meconium aspiration. So clinically correlate and report and recommendations, if any. Well, I've got a right-sided anterior tension pneumothorax. Uh, I'm, I've, I've basically decided I'm going to do a needle thoracentesis. So that, that is your standardized reporting form. This is all available to you in the Dropbox. And again, the nomenclature for reporting, also if you want to use BLAT score, you can document in your report that you've used anterolateral calculations. But in the report, we just have a small region which basically works out and keeps the, the BLAT score in. For the purposes of your peer review, you will purely be using anterolateral scanning. And anterolateral scanning for me means that if you want to standardize and use either the six or 12 region method, just remember 12 region method is R1, R2 anterior, R3, R4 lateral, L1, L2 anterior, L3, L4 lateral. If you want to use the comprehensive scan, then keep your terminology consistent. Please use numbering. I, it gets really confusing with right upper lateral, right lower lateral, uh, just in terms of scanning, I would encourage you to number your regions. As you get used to it, you'll find the beauty of being able to use the regions and use the reporting form makes reporting much, much easier. Okay. Any questions about this? Uh, Dr. Alok, you told that in peer uh, review, you need only anterior and anterior lateral scans. So does it mean R1, R2 and L1, uh, L1, L2? Okay. Anterior lateral. So R1, R2 are anterior, L1, L2 are lateral. But you want R1, R2, R3, R4, L1, L2, L3, L4. 
Can okay. I sh can I give you an example very quickly? I'm just gonna stop share. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so just revision. What is the normal lung? So the normal lung, basically from our perspective, is the batwing sign. So ribs, rib shadow, that's pleura. So that's your batwing. And this is really when you, you do your scanning and you start with transverse scanning, you need to identify that you can see the batwing sign. If you cannot see the batwing sign, you're either not in the right place, you're either got ribs in between, but a simple example, and I just want you to have a look, is if you're too low on the right or the left side. So simple, if you're on the, on the left side, you'll start getting stomach. Now the stomach basically gives you a very nice A dash profile, which looks like a pneumothorax. But what is important is that you won't be able to see ribs. So if you can't see ribs with pleura in that region, then really from your perspective, you're not actually seeing the batwing sign, so you're too low. So the most important thing is you should be able to confirm a batwing sign. Now, this is a young adult. You can see with the respiratory rate, he's breathing very slowly. Naturally, sliding is less visible, but you can see it on the right-hand side. I don't have any problems with it over here. This is a three-day-old baby who's just adapting. Now, this is right anterior upper, also known as R1. Okay, uh, good sliding. Again, you can see the batwing sign, one rib space over here. Uh, not much of a rib shadow, but pleura that's visible, that's sliding. So it's continuous, smooth, uninterrupted. Uh, below it, there are some comet tails, which we'll talk about. But are there any bee lines? Anybody? Yes, there are. Where? Yes. On the left side, I can see your B line, which is which is touching the lower part of the screen. Yeah. So just for your knowledge, these aren't true B lines in the middle. They're comet tails. So comet tails usually end before you go down to the bottom. So they would not be classified as B lines. This is a normal transitioning lung, which is well aerated. I can see A lines. But the reason I'm showing you this image is I am basically using a low frequency. And because I'm using a low frequency, I have good depth penetration, but actually my pickup of A lines, the superficial areas is not so good. If I increase my frequency, so this is this image per se by anatomy is, is okay. Uh, but the probe and frequency I'm using is not okay. And this is, it's a poor quality image. So I'm, I would like to show you <clears throat> what transition looks like. And these are images. Now, again, I'm using terminology here of R1, R3. Now, you can see the batwing sign. And the batwing sign, basically, uh, you have a caustic shadow for the ribs and you have pleura. Now, the pleura over here looks blurred, a little bit irregular. But I'm not convinced that I've got any subpleural consolidations. And what I've got is this really large area that looks white. It's basically B lines that have merged together and formed columns. And these are basically compact B lines for you. Again, my problem here is I am using a low or a high frequency, anybody? Anybody? We're using 15 high, high frequency. Well, that's that's the probe. It doesn't say what frequency over here. That's the probe. Okay. But you're right. You're absolutely right. I am using high frequency. And because I'm using a high frequency, the superficial areas are well demarcated, but I'm actually using depth. But that's that's important. I want to see the superficial area because I'm worried that this baby might have RDS. 
And really, when I look at this particular area, R1, I can see that it's got compact B lines with pleura that looks blurred, but is more or less continuous and no subpleural consolidations. Uh, when I come to this region, R3, again, I can see lung that's well aerated. I can see an area that is compact B lines. And this is what is classically called as a double lung point. Now, there's small areas here that, that are actually comet tails. And then there's an area here that looks like it might be might have a snowflake appearance. Actually, they're less than five millimeters. And this is a near-term baby who basically is an heir with a little bit of respiratory distress. So when I clinically correlate, I've got a double lung point. I've got some, uh, you know, well aerated lung. So clinical correlation would kind of say, well, this could be transient tachypnea newborn. But again, my big problem over here is I'm losing out on the depth. The depth here is about four centimeters and I can't see the deeper area of the lung. In order to see the deeper area of the lung, I'll either have to move my focus down or I might have to reduce my frequency a bit. This is L1 and you can see L1 is very well aerated. So again, pleura, the batwing sign with pleura, A lines, no B lines at all. And pleura, that's moving. There's a little bit of lung pulse because of the heart over there. So the reason I know Pleura is moving is I can see these small comet tails which appear and disappear. If you can see small comet tails, as you see over here, appears, now, disappears. Appears, now, disappears. Then they can't be an omothorax. The Pleura must be moving. Again, with breathing, I can see aerated lung in the middle over here. So an A profile. But with a B profile over here, so we'll talk about profiles next time. But this, again, for me, represents double lung point. Now, the important thing is I've got aeration as I move from front to back. But naturally, because this baby is supine, the front has aerated nicely, but the back hasn't. And this is just a reflection of the fact that I'm in the lateral area, L3, left upper axilla. Now, the left upper axilla is very difficult to get because the arm is abducted. I've got a nice image over here because I've got one, two, nearly three intercostal spaces. And it's because I've got the nurse to abduct the arm. I'm losing out on depth because I'm using a high frequency. And then this is a preterm baby for you. And classically what you can see, again, I'm just giving you an example of how terminology differs. Now I'm looking at R1, but it's labeled low. Now is this the right lower region of R1 is this R2. So the problem with using different terminologies, and that's the method behind the madness here is, it just makes things really confusing for somebody who's coming back and might want to do a serial scan about which region are we talking about. And that's why I would say that whatever you decide, stick to it. My, my advice would be use the 12 region method, stick to the numbering, avoid using upper and lower. It just makes things very confusing. Upper, lower, lateral, upper anterior, then you get confused. Somebody uses the word anterolateral and then you're even more confused. But if you look at this, this is a preterm baby. Pleura is discontinuous. It's irregular. And you can see subpleural consolidations here. These are not comet tails. They are more than five millimeters. Now, again, I'm just giving you an example of I've got good depth penetration up here. I can see the image all the way down. Now, this is basically a 23 weeker. And what I've got is good established RDS in this baby because I've got subtural consolidations, a little bit of aeration that I can see over there. But what I can also see is a small consolidation coming up over here with that lectesis. Now, again, when I report, I'm going to report a consolidation in this area, but I'm going to mention subtural consolidations with a snowflake sign, which are more visible in R1 as compared to R2. So, it's really important that you label accurately. And as you move laterally, what you can see is L3 is completely white out. R3 is completely white out because the baby's supine. The anterior region's a little bit better aerated on the left side as compared to the, the posterior regions and lateral regions. So your labeling is quite crucial. Any questions? Because we're going to have to make a stop there. 
uh, please, for the preterm images, the previous ones, um, one of them had like um, uh, the one, uh, yes, this one, the 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 picture in the, um, uh, the in the middle, this drop out area. No, yes, this this blackish area in the middle. Yeah. Does this it still be here? One? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So my gut feeling at this particular point is, it's probably a lack of contact. Yes. Hmm. I might not have and. Just a, another good example, you know, to say that if I don't have good contact, can you see how the soft tissue itself, the thickness varies? But if you look at the image on the left-hand side, it's more mm -hmm. uniform. And yes. the, this is why this this image at this particular point, I, I'm getting this small area. But can you see those ribs there? Yeah. They're contributing to this area of dropout. But it's a lack of good contact that's contributing to this. Okay, and with the next slide, uh, no, not this with the next slide, the other one that has the four images. Yes, um, the upper right one. Yeah, I can see a lines as well. So can we call these like? So this is uh, this is this this image here. No, in L three. Yeah, yeah. So what is happening is when the baby breathes in, the ventilator goes in. You have aeration. That's why you can see A-lines. And again, this brings me back to that concept that I spoke to you about. People talk about B profile and B-lines breaking A-lines. Actually, when you inspire or when the ventilator pushes air in, you will see A-lines and they don't necessarily get broken. This is a big compact B-line. This is a big compact B-line. They were kind of coalesced together. These, these areas here have subtural consolidations, but there's an element of aeration coming in as air goes in. So when the baby either inspires or air goes in with the ventilator. But this is classically, uh, again, if you were to ask me what profile this is, this is a B profile. And I'll explain next time why. Okay. And this is not like a worrying sign that this baby could have uh, like... Uh, pneumothorax? Uh, yeah. And yes. Or uh, or pre, pre pneumothorax state. No. Like, no, because I can see sliding. Pneumothorax, you'll not get sliding. Can you see the movement? Can you see mm -hmm. these small comet tails? They're yes. moving. So if they're moving laterally and you have plural sliding, you can't have an omothorax. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. But more about that later on. Okay. Any other you. questions? <clears throat> but Alu, in this uh, this week's uh, peer review, are, are you expecting us to present only normal uh, lung No, views, no, present or? what you want. Okay. Present what you want. We have an hour of peer review on Thursday. We're going to start at 7. We can do up to late 30, depending on how much interest people have. Can I just, before everybody peels off, this is really crucial for me. So the one thing that we have to cover in great detail is profiles and nomenclature. Now, Abhijit will be starting with that session next Sunday. But I would say that please put a probe on. Even if you can't store the images if you have to consent parents, speak to them, please just take whatever probe you have and put a probe on and try and locate the batwing sign and try and make an impression of whether you can see A or B lines. It might be a term baby who's come in with respiratory distress. You're looking at babies who are stable. You're looking at babies who have a clinical indication for you to do the scan. But what is very important you know, from my perspective is that you put a probe on the baby. We've now covered three sessions of the induction. We have covered a session on the introduction to lung ultrasound, basics, physiology, and physics. And today we have covered the protocol. And I need you to be completely familiar with physics and the protocol going forwards. Because from next time onwards, we are going to cover nomenclature and signs of what we see in normal lung. Profiles. Now, standardized profiles and their description is something that we only teach on this course. And I cannot emphasize how important it is because to mental model and make sure that you're reporting appropriately, you need to know the difference between an A profile, an A' profile, a B profile, a B' profile, and B profiles can be quite varied. But more importantly, what you call a C profile or consolidation profile in RDS versus a pneumonia. 
And then at the end of it, really, there are certain signs that are quite crucial to pattern recognition. You must be very well versed in them uh, as your scanning proceeds. Okay, anything else? Okay, so can I just have uh, everybody, any feedback that you have about the first few sessions, please come back to me in the WhatsApp group. If there's something you haven't understood, please come back to me in the WhatsApp group because then our focus will be really as we cover the next few sessions is to make sure that we've covered any deficiencies that we've not been able to iron out. Okay, God bless you all. I'm really grateful. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.